we were just hanging out last week anyway, so it's not like mm -hmm. we're good at social distancing. All right. We are live with viewers and all that fun stuff. Woohoo! Yes, and an extra extra person on here. Yes, we have a third. We have a third. <clears throat> yeah, Hello, saying. how are you guys? Yo! How's it Yo. going? Good, how are you doing? Doing all right. So if you can't tell by now, this is Ronald McGuire, one of our uh, special guests for this week. Scoot myself closer. There we go. <laughs> I'm sitting here ah. reading the. Uh, I'm reading the comments, and already, I see people say, "Where is Mo?" Yeah, we're still not sure what happened to Mo. He's uh, preoccupied. He's supposed to come on this week, but I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know. No Mo this week, but we do have another special guest, Ronald. Hello, how are you guys Ronald, doing? You should uh, you should give yourself an uh, intro. Introduce yourself to the uh, to the family. Hi, uh, I work with Xavier. Uh, that's my day job. Um, we, we do, uh, you know, penetration testing, exploitation, those kind of things. Um, my background is, is quite a bit different. Um, uh, I'm probably one of the few on the phone that uh, actually has a, a government-related background. Um, I've worked at most all of the three-letter agencies uh, inside the United States uh, and in conjunction with some of them overseas uh doing a lot of a lot of interesting and fun things so uh i'm here to kind of talk and answer any questions and as much as i can how's that yeah, <laughs> classified <laughs> interesting things right yeah. classified <laughs> interesting things any things they make movies about how's that mm -hmm. exactly. here you go. yeah they can make it in a movie as long as they change some names and things like that um but you, you're the behind the scenes the real work that was done to make those events newsworthy <laughs> exactly somebody has to actually do the work for the people to say oh look what we did <laughs> yeah 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 as um it was really interesting uh there's a uh I, I can leave a link to it but if you follow there's a um podcast i follow called jordan harbinger and it was funny because the journalist not really funny but there was a guy who was an informant and um was informing on a lot of uh, terrorist organizations he was someone who was radicalized and turned to the other side really interesting person but he was outed by uh like rolling stone because someone really wanted to get a good article out there and they just started dropping everybody's names and it gave all the correlation data but it was a whole step through on all that and it's like I, I and it really explains that touch and go relationship you have with someone who's doing the work, and you know you want people to know you're doing good, but you can't let too many details out because there's quietness that does have to surround those operations and the people involved in them. So it's kind of it's really an interesting balancing act, and they covered that really well in the podcast. I thought that was really interesting. Someone who starts on the informant side but also became on the outed. And he was actually outed by Dick Cheney, is the one who did it. <laughs> uh, and he was an uh, he was an operative for, <laughs> he was an informant for mi6 um and uh, but they were yeah. mi6 was advising the u.s side of things uh it's it's a really crazy story um wow. but it's worth reading because it's one of those uh uh or worth diving into. <laughs> I'll find it and leave it in the show notes, though. It's uh, if you want to listen to an interesting podcast of that side of someone who can talk about what they did <laughs> and things they were involved in. <laughs> it's interesting because there's a lot of a lot of people have been burned over the years inadvertently, not by something they did, but by something that somebody else did completely, like you were saying, in completely in, in irrelevant to them. Um, you know, it, it happens a lot and lots of times, unfortunately, it doesn't just mean it's the end of your career. It could be the end of your life. Yeah. I was going to so. say what happens, man. That's like, uh, it, you know, beyond the, the career ending, it's like you almost got to look over your shoulder for the rest of your life always at that point. And that's what it was. With, his name is uh, Aimean Dean and uh, he was, he turned on Al Qaeda. So he still has a hit on his life and can't go a lot of places, um, and when they outed him, he was uh, in the Middle East still. He's like, oh boy, uh, <laughs> he's and uh, it, so it's been. He's been outed for a while because he, it's been 
free from that uh, being an informant for like uh, 15 years. But <clears throat> it's still 15 years later. He's like, you look over your shoulder. Uh, no, this is not my real name. And <laughs> like, he wrote a book about it. So he's at least. Cool and golf he's... Or is that a real ticking noise? I don't... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear a he's... ping, but I don't know if that's oil. or. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, none, none less, when we get too far off topic, I'll swing back over to tech topics because it's a. Uh... <laughs> we didn't even introduce ourselves, Tom. I'm Xavier oh. D. Johnson. Tom Lawrence. There you go. And this is episode 56 of How They Got Hacked. Mm-hmm. Wow. 56 of these episodes. Yeah. 55, and, uh... if you didn't see it, we were live from DEF CON Scar Hacking Village. Yeah, Tom's that was a lot of fun. Tom in there with me. Yeah, I got you know I got to see behind the scenes at DEF CON, see how the uh, how the sausage is made, how the cars got hacked, uh, watch how they opened up cars to the uh, greater world, I guess you could say, for hacking. So that was definitely really an interesting aspect of it. Um, you guys had that Tesla plugged in so people could live log in and hack, and then literally as simple as it sounds, there was a laptop with a webcam pointing at the Tesla screen so you could see what was happening on the screen as you were uh, banging away, running commands against the car. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was amazing. So we had uh, the few live vehicles. We had some equipment overseas over in the UK. We had some equipment over in Asia, and then there was some equipment here local. Um, at one of our corporate sponsors with Aptiv, which is where Justin works. Um, so there was a large coordination of people uh, with a bunch of raspberry pies and can hats and, and wires running into to benches. And it was just exciting to put on and exhilarating to see. There were winners of the uh, the CTF, I think Hack for Charity won this year, with second place being uh, can openers, I believe. So And... I was fascinated by uh, Amy Deedy, who had the uh, implanted chip in her hand that lit up. Yes. That was RFID was chip badass. with a green LED. So when you bring it close to RFID, it lights up. That was just neat. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty badass. And we actually got to play with her Proxmox that Sunday. Uh, she taught me a bunch about how that radio stuff works. And now mm. i got to go and get me a Proxmox. <laughs> oh, neat. Yeah, she's uh, she's also a Lego Minecraft hacker, which I thought was interesting. Wow, that's her other hobby. I and, mean, she uh, was there hacking satellites. So she hacked satellites. Hacked. That's actually, you know, I guess her job. <laughs> I asked her. I, she she said, "I can't say shit." I said, "Okay, there you go. There's the answer." <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> I said, yeah. Now that Xavier needs to look over his shoulder because <laughs> he knows too much. Yeah. You know too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there's probably a lot of assumptions that are made that they're in space, so they're, they're, no one's messing with them in space, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. If only people understood how little power it took to get a signal so far. <laughs> you don't need a huge base station. You just need, like, a regular old wall outlet, and you can shoot shit across the ocean and into space effectively if you could you guys remember the reason why we were all freaked out about the russians getting to space first because that means they had a rocket that works <laughs> yeah they had the whole sputnik thing and you worried about north korea having a rocket too you know shit gets put on those. if you just aim them the right way <laughs> you got more than space to worry about Anyway. Uh, lots of fun. That was one of, the, one of the things in the Cold War was Russia putting satellites in space or objects in space. And then if they bring them out of orbit at the right time, they can roughly have a, a, a bomb that they can point at, you know, anywhere in the world because yeah. it's dropping out of space at the speed of sound. Oh, sure. yeah. It's still, it's still a worry for, for uh, as far as Yeah, I wherever can those tell. things land, they're going to crater. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's a huge crater. So you know, you could charge it at a city. Hey, <laughs> you know, you take a half of it out. So but now we got SpaceX. So we'll just like aim something at it. You know, like I believe <laughs> in SpaceX. They are reusing pods and they're going back and forth from the ISS. I'm just really amazed as a kid who wanted to be an astronaut. Like, wait, I could have actually been an astronaut. Like, there's private companies that are going to space now between. Yeah. Did you see the price that they brought down their pound to go to space, though? 
I mean, it's literally in the thousands of dollars now. So he dropped it from hundreds of thousands of dollars down to thousands of dollars per pound. You know, to that's the thing that space. blows my mind. So, you know, they give Elon shit about the cars and things like that and whatnot. But I'm like, you guys don't realize how much he's changed some of the other industries. I mean, he has dramatically changed the space industry. And arguably, that's a bigger accomplishment than what he's done with the right. cars. The cars feel like a hobby when you compare scales that he's working at. Yeah. He is really engineering the aerospace engineer, you know, bringing it down to um, the levels he has, like you said, a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, I should say, to send something into space. Um, that actually, there's a uh, lot of opportunity that was opened up by that because you have startups that go, I have an idea, I want to, you know, get this for a science experiment or whatever, but it required them to raise a hundred thousand dollars in funding, not a few thousand dollars. So it became unattainable for a lot of smaller companies to do any type of zero gravity experiments. Any of that became difficult. He's actually making that way easier than ever. Yeah. And in between, he dropped off a guy at the space station. That's <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> and got him back. <laughs> amazing. And got him yeah. back. And got him later and brought him back. That's, yeah, yeah, and brought him know, back. Yeah, yeah. That's the round whole thing trip. that uh, <laughs> a round yeah, trip. Yeah, round trip. Yeah, round trip. SpaceX <laughs> Uber. <laughs> Most airplanes can't do that. Air company, airlines companies can't do that right now. <laughs> they, yeah, they're having a whole whole another problem there. So, yeah, it's a pretty pretty awesome. Less awesome is a Texas man sentenced oh. to fifty seven months for computer hacking and Ooh. aggravated identity oh. theft. For one, that's. How do I wrap my mind around this? So he's hacking tech companies and uh, it's like, all right, you're young enough where you probably don't need to like do this for them. You're not like some, some like, uh, well, excuse me, you're old enough where you know better, basically. Like you're not yeah. the 14 year old uh, Twitter hacker, right? So, I mean, at, at the age of 31, you know, North from South, East from West and uh, 57 months, That'll, that'll teach you a lesson. I guess when you talk about uh, aggravated identity theft, uh, basically uh, just from, from the house, apparently, he decided that he wanted to steal data and, uh, and hack. So FBI came and smacked him down. He also got a two-year term for, uh, of a supervised release. And about twenty k, thirty k or so in restitution. So, trial was over in five days. Um, I that's a pretty fast time. I mean, it probably was nice and easy. Apparently, uh, there were fake administrator accounts being used. Um, he had an insider, Ashley St. Andrea, and they were able to bypass the company's security measures, uh, which is. When they were able to go ahead and get the uh, the passwords of uh, the users via their password cracking programs, as they're calling it, which probably just uh, a password list <laughs> or John the Ripper <laughs> or something simple. Just to be honest with you, it's <laughs> uh, but yeah, any script key, any script key cracker yeah. out there. I really it's feel like we need to separate people. Um, you know, obviously our law in here in the U.S. bases a lot of things on intent. And they throw the book sometimes at the young kids, which is a shame because a lot of times their intent was less than malicious. It's more kids will be kids. Not that that's a justification, but there's a chance to rehabilitate them and focus their energy elsewhere. If you're doing dumb shit by the time you're older, <laughs> just you're going it's to jail. It's hard to rehabilitate. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about his co-conspirator got time served. Um and, and got two years supervised release. So it's called you talk, you walk. <laughs> here you go. I was about to say it sounds like someone was doing a lot of talking. I mean, with a five day trial, there had to be something there. Somebody fought something. Right? It's five days worth of going back and forth. If there was somebody talking, typically it'd probably be like a three day in and out. So yeah. That's, the other unbalanced aggravation that people have pointed out many times, though, is that just in general, hacking crimes can get you uh, multitudes, magnitudes higher uh, of sentencing 
than aggravated assault even. Um, they they carry some, I mean, some of these charges carry as much as manslaughter does. <laughs> it's like, I the balance on these is kind of interesting, but also once you're older though, it, uh, throw it out the door. You don't, you, you should have known better, but it's also interesting to see how the courts are balancing this out. And it's becoming a popular thing. I mean, we, you go a few years ago, there's really weren't that many people being caught. And when they did, they threw the book at the few they caught. Now we're actually starting to see catch up with a few more of them, but it's, the courts are going to have to really get more tech savvy, have a better understanding of this. That way they can apply rules in a more coherent manner. And are you seeing how low the restitution is? Like the restitution here is so... That is weird. really low. And like the, I mean, the time is not even really crazy, to be honest with you. I mean, when you think about oh, getting caught as a ransomware operator or those dudes that are like doing the Mirai botnet, they're, gonna, they're up against like 20 plus year sentences for the amount of damages that they've caused. They've done hundreds of millions of dollars of damages. This dude is basically up against 35, some 36K in restitution when he gets out, where if he was stealing data, he probably made more than that. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know. You remember, uh, what was it, a, two years ago where the, the hacker that stole all that money, what, uh, like $13, $3 billion or something, they sent it all to charity and they executed him. Oh, wow, really? Wow. Yeah, I think it was in, it may have been Iran. I remember something. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> they actually literally executed the guy and he didn't even keep the money. He gave the money to charity and they wow. still executed him for hacking. <laughs> yeah, that's that's intense. Yeah. That's Let's intense. How, how good we got it over here in the States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prison doesn't seem so bad compared to execution. Right. 57 <laughs> months death. 57 months. Well, that depends on who you're talking. <laughs> yeah. Right. 57 months could be as good as death for some. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tel Aviv in the news, huh? North Korean hacking groups attacking Israeli defense industry. So, um, here, let me get this pulled up on the screen for the folks. So, let's be clear here. Uh, we expect this at a point. Um, for me, what throws me off is this data that's being stolen. Is North Korea even going to be able to use it? Like, there's a level of sophistication that comes along with the the jet plans for Israeli jet fighters. Like you're not going to be able to just spin up a factory and meet their level of quality or, you know, match their design, et cetera, right? Like at a That's point- That's a really fair point. It's like, you know, you're stealing something that you, you probably can't use. So this is clearly for you to resell it, right? Yeah. Like this is data that you're trying to sell to I mean, it says right here, even people like Iran, even though I don't think they would sell it with Iran, I think they would trade for things like, you know, enriched, er, er, enriched uh, uranium and shit or, like that. Or just working missiles. <laughs> or just working missiles at all, right? Like, that, yeah. <laughs> that would be a start. I don't yeah, know. It's kind of interesting. And Israel, um, Israel has already pretty much made this clear. Attacking cyber things, they have no problems with physically attacking you back. So yeah, they've well, uh, we've seen it. I mean, we've seen rockets get shot into apartment buildings of hackers because yeah. I mean They're and not that's playing been around. that's been unprecedented. I haven't seen any follow up to that. I haven't seen it happen again. But I'll tell you what, there's one place I'm not gonna go fuck around with. I don't want a rocket shot through my window. Like that's just <laughs> For a map scan, like that's taking yeah. it to the next level. You end map them, they remove you from the map. You know, they they see it as. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I don't think How through the ago was that time. Was that in 2019 or 2018 that that happened? It was when we first started because we talked about this in the earliest uh, episodes of how they got hacked. Because um, we were talking about it was an it was a absolute military show of force response that Israel had uh, to you know, attacks on their network. They, they stopped them completely. Um, and I, I think mean, that's just part of their public, posturing. 
this was a public housing building. So it's not like it was extremely targeted. Like they didn't poison them with, you know, poisonous sniper bullets like the Russians. They shot a missile into a building where, where like potentially kids were too. And that's a show of force if there, if there ever was one. Yeah, that's, um, they're not messing around. We're going to keep seeing a lot more of the North Koreans. They're definitely ramping things up a bit. What's interesting here is they claim, they claim that the attack was deflected in real time, which kind of makes me think about what is the tooling that it takes to, to stop something that, uh, you know, is ongoing, right? Like they don't really go into their list of, of tooling, but I doubt they're just running like, you know, like, well, maybe they are. What if they were running Huntress? They were just like, oh, look, they're going, what if they're, what if they're using Sentinel, right? Like they could be using off the, what if they're using security on you? They're just responding to the alerts. I wonder, right? Like my brain takes this, like, how did you, yeah. how did you catch him? Like, I want to know. They never reveal that fun part. No, of course <laughs> not. They're claiming that this is uh, Lazarus, which. They seem to be developing, you know, I don't know enough about how they're determining attribution, but they do seem to be blaming more things about uh, the Lazarus group. They seem to have more tells that kind of help them identify that particular group. And I Are found it, uh, Dark Knight Diaries had a one-off episode uh, they released where they kind of dove into um, interviewing someone that was a defector from North Korea. And the part that got interesting was at the end, talking about how they train people for hacking, how it's kind of, there's a big push uh, for that. Like they're pretty focused on it. And they can be focused on it because the North Koreans, the only computer access they do is to do something illegal on there. So um, there's not a lot of opportunity there. So when they hand you the only computer you'll have access to do the hacking, I imagine you focus pretty hard on that. North Especially Korea. when you're talking about such a totalitarian regime there uh, that they have in North Korea. North Korea scares me because they got nothing to lose. Right? It's you kind of it. That's... You can't do. You can't put sanctions against them because no. they already don't have access to the internet. We already don't trade with them, and the people that they do trade with don't care about them having sanctions. And I mean, you know, wanna cry? It says it right here on the screen, right? Uh, they are ruthless. They will come up with new and creative ways to be able to uh, to ruin you. So, yeah, I. Uh, it's the I only flow of money North into Korea's the country going, it, Be, because all, of all those trade sanctions. North Korea's yeah. only opportunity to make money really comes down to, or this. their big one, I should say, is a lot of the hacking. That's probably a massive amount of income uh, because they're unbalanced. Otherwise, you know, what other income does right. that country have? Right. Everything else is control so they have no other income yeah so. they just have really locked it down there quite a bit so that's pretty much well you guys can steal <laughs> and there's no what's someone gonna do get mad at us and not trade things with us <laughs> right what's the worst that's gonna happen mm -hmm. and there's nothing else to do so they literally you know it's it's kind of like you get so bored that you concentrate like you're saying they get all your time into it because there's literally nothing else to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was then I I thought that was weird at first when I started listening to Darknet Diaries to interview a defector from North Korea, but then the bleak life that person had to leave prior to them defecting, but then talking about the computer science side and things like that, you're like, wow, I would definitely love to do that because there's really nothing else going on. Like people starve to death. It's very broken society. Um, right. So probably a yeah. rock star type of job. Yeah, there's like, really would, not a lot of other jobs there. It's it's very primitive living. And uh, they were talking about like even the cities don't have electricity all the time. Outside of Pyongyang, the main capital city, they only turn the electricity on when the uh, dear leader, as they refer to him, comes to those cities. So they turn it on for some celebrations and they turn it back off when they're done. Like, yeah, you guys don't get power. Really a weird place that it's weird that that exists. That's the way it's like, that, like, it's just a gamble. Like yeah. you could be born into that shit. That's what really. Well, you me. lose the genetic lottery being born there, don't you? <laughs> Man. <laughs> Man. Like there could have been so much innovation that come out of that place. They probably have unique problems or really smart people. Like there could be somebody who could change the world, who was born into a system that won't allow them to. <laughs> yep. That's just not 
Okay. Very, very limited that's options not, if you're born there. That's for sure. And it's not just you, this generation. It goes back. Your status in the society goes back four generations there. Wow. So your great, great, great grandfather could have done something that screws you up and you didn't even know the dude. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, that's, um, they have that trouble. And I didn't realize what a problem to become here. Not to get too off topic, but it, Cisco is face, was facing an, a discrimination lawsuit. And I'm like, oh, great, you know, some other stuff. And I'm like, whoa, no. It was uh, groups of people that were native from India discriminating against other classes of Indian people there. And uh, apparently, because they, they have, I, I'm less aware of it, so I'm speaking out of turn, other than I know they have some type of class in sections in their society, um, and different people have different elevations, but here they're treated as equal. But once they get a management yeah. position, they're like, no, your family is not part of my family's class. Therefore, they would pass them up for promotion. And uh, so that was mm -hmm. in uh, Cisco and That's... a couple other places face lawsuits. And it's been a challenging thing because apparently they do this without the other people understanding, like the other uh, native uh, Americans are like, what are they doing? I don't know why we didn't know he was doing this and we didn't, they were speaking and not understanding. So I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, that does go on there. It's something we kind of take for granted that we don't have that here. Not that we have a perfect society, not without <laughs> our flaws, but there's a whole new, like through a monkey wrench in there and Cisco's like, how, how do we get this mess? <laughs> no matter where you go, you can count on people being shitty. Yeah, you can count on some people being shitty, and they apparently brought some shittiness when they imported them over here. So, <laughs> no matter where you go, there's mm -hmm. people, there's shit. But you can always go to Sands and get some good infosec training, right? People click shit too. Yeah, um, they should do some Sands. fishing training with some of the uh, side. <laughs> <laughs> they have a class on that there, maybe. Would you like some realistic training? We actually <laughs> click links. So let's be clear. One click link can ransomware in your entire business. So this is no laughing matter. All right. But it looks like a single phishing email was able to uh, to make it through. And a single em e uh, employee's email was impacted. Uh, seems like no other systems were compromised. But uh, it does look like the... Uh, the instru the uh, the instructor that was breached or the uh, employee that was breached uh, allowed for a rule to be set up to be forwarded uh, through uh, Office 365, which uh, took about 513 emails with some containing a total of approximately 28,000 records of PII for SANS members. Now, this PII is not credit cards, emails, laissez splee Course information. <laughs> That it, it is some personal information in there. So um. this is one of the things we've seen a lot too. It's not just when they click the phishing email that they, you know, get access to something as much as they focus on getting them emails forwarded. Uh, we have to, anytime we take over a new client, we have to scan and look for this because we see these, a lot of people don't even know they have fallen for them. And then they have all their emails being sent out somewhere else and forwarded like that. That's a common thing. I wish Microsoft would make that easier, I guess. Um, you know what? I don't blame Microsoft because this is a problem everywhere for every yeah. system. When you authenticate with a third party through an OAuth, you better go audit that list because those companies get so those tokens barely get rolled. Well, that's the challenge. Microsoft has not made it as easy to audit as they do to enable. And uh, there's there's some new tools coming out that help look for that flag being flipped and ways to lock it down on a network so that way it doesn't happen. Um, but Microsoft doesn't have, they got a very manual process for doing it is the best way to describe it. They didn't automate it as much as they can. Microsoft, I, I think sometimes Microsoft's answer is they want to leave gaps. Like, hey, we'll just let some third party come up with a solution for the thing that we don't feel like doing. Well, I mean, <laughs> RDP works really good. So maybe yeah. this is this is good for them, you know? Like third party <laughs> people make good shit for them every once in a while and they license it out and it works. Like, I'll be honest, right? A total aside, Tom. I love X to go. X to go is amazing. Yep. But copy and paste from the host to the client in RDP is so seamless. It is. It's like X to go is just about there. 
to the point where maybe Microsoft one day will buy them or so, or you know, or, or license them. They'll, they'll actually place- in- institute some open source. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Keep them open source. We need an open source solution. It's just no copy paste. I, I do like the sentence at the bottom of this. As a cybersecurity training organization, few entities are better equipped to perform the incident response to this compromise than their own personnel. There I was thinking it too. I'm like, they they have the damn best team on it there. <laughs> and by the way, I did misspeak earlier. Uh, while credit cards did not get lifted, your email address, personal name, all that jazz did get lifted. So, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. So you should be on the lookout for those nice targeted phishing attacks. Yep. That are coming here and there. Yes. Yeah, coming that, soon. The other, yeah, the other thing we've seen with a lot of the forwarding recently, at least in some of the investigations I've been doing, uh, come around the fraud. So as you know, most of the banks out there have, uh, have you know, you authenticate and then they send you an email message and then you type in the code that came from the email message and that's what they're using as their MFA because, you know, most individuals don't set it up in, <laughs> on their phone or something like that. And so if they're forwarding those email messages, then I can go in there and I can use that as a validation. And then I can change bank records and things like that. And that's what the hacker's doing is they're having all of that information forwarded. And you can go in there and legitimately click on, say, your retirement fund, ADP, and say, hey, I want to change my password, send, send it, the, the link to you, but it gets forwarded to the bad guy. He goes in and changes his password. Then it changes the bank account information and then the empties your retirement account. Um, that's one of the one of the recent uh, fraud cases that, that we ran across was that exact scenario. So, you know, just because, you know, you fell for a phishing campaign doesn't mean they're, you know, targeting your box for, for malicious malware. They, they right. may have another yeah. agenda. Well, and that's, that's why point, when huh? we've taken over clients, they don't even know it's on. They don't even know it's been yeah. going on because that they, they didn't do anything for that years. would set off a flag on the computer. They just flipped the switch and started forwarding email. And the reality is once your email is compromised, everything is because how do I reset anything? It all starts with you know a, a link back to my email, everything. So that's the pivot point um, right now that there's a lot of focus on. Yeah. A really good point. Keep your email <laughs> locked down tight. That's what's important. <laughs> yeah. Use the the burning go email accounts, the ones that only stay there for like thirty minutes and then they're wiped. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's helpful too. I haven't used one of those in a while. Also, we got thirty five people watching. Yes, thirty five wow. likes. Yeah, thirty. Oh, it said thirty seven for a minute. Come on. Nice. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I know you guys can do it. Yeah. Come join Meanwhile, us. Loki join the fun. Some content. <clears throat> <laughs> Citrix. Now, I'm an XCP fan. I know XCP and G and Citrix. Yeah. Tomato, tomato. Uh, or Zen server, so to speak. Zen versus Zen server. Yep. But this is something different, right? Right, Tom? This do not affect me. This no. Citrix, The Citrix bug that hackers will be moving quickly to exploit yeah they're uh the citrix is really not having a good time lately so a nope. new a newly real set of vulnerabilities and popular software made by citrix whose clients include fortune 500 like how they always bring every sentence as you know fortune 500 companies use these right <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there's Pretty another exploit time. in their Citrix endpoint management or Zen Mobile, which allows remote connection of corporate networks. Now, this is all centered not around exactly the Zen server software that I talk right. about, which is XCPNG, which is based on the Zen hypervisor. This is more based on um, all the different tools Citrix has for remote working. Which is probably extremely critical right now since we're in the coronavirus times. And I know of customers of mine that are mitigating uh, the typical risk that they have around ransomware, around patching, around management by saying, hey, we're moving into Citrix for our critical workloads and we're using dumb terminals to go and deal with you know, highly secure environments. So the moment that you have a, a, you know, that connectivity, that application is your weak spot then uh, there's no point in you having an amazingly secure and segmented Citrix because you know now I'm just using that client, that dumb client. I'm just piggybacking on a, on a real session. Yeah. Even it's, worse than that with the dumb client is 
when you're done and they turn it off, all the evidence is gone, literally. Yep. So it's a, it's a hacker's dream because you're the one that's wiping, cleaning their tracks up for them. Yeah, and we already know Citrus themselves had a massive amount of data X filled out. We think that's part of what was led to all this because it sounds like they lost a bunch of source code to these. So these hacks have been kind of leaking out slowly. And because, hey, like that headline says right at the beginning, so many Fortune 500 companies are using these, it's undoubtedly a lot of it. They first probably use it for some X fill of data in these companies, get what they want. And instead of keeping a foothold before they get discovered, they drop it on the world and uh, let all the noise keep the uh, people busy for a while after that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's like burning down the house after you rob it. No one knows that you robbed the house because now you just drop, you know, you drop this exploit out there. We got, all right, we got the nation state information we want um, before they trace that back to us. Just drop this zero day out there and let everyone attack it. <laughs> the incident response people will be just sorting through logs the next two years trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, uh, especially if they the can't get more than 10 logs at a time when they're elastic. <laughs> yeah. It'll be like the running of the bulls. They're just like, we open the floodgates and let this fly out. And now you, there's no evidence we were ever there because there's evidence that everybody was there. <laughs> I think Ron fell off. Uh oh, Ron, you there? Hey, we'll Boy. see if he reconnects. I'll we'll keep an eye out for him. On. What do we got? What do we got next? What do we got next? Uh, we got kind of a couple things here. We got China blocking, and I thought this might be worth mentioning about ESNI and how that works. So, you whenever you're this is. Whenever you go to a website, there's different ways you can block. ESNI, now, now teach us because, you know, I know, I know you told me before we got on, but this ESNI thing, you got to you gotta catch me up to speed. All right. So the SNI, whenever you go to a website, um, in the early days of the website, everything was a one-to-one -one ratio for IP addresses and domains. Well, that didn't scale. So one IP address can have multiple domains on it. So, you know, lawrencesystems.com actually has many, many websites. So how do you know what certificate to get? You know what certificate because your browser sends the SNI. So it's requesting and saying, hey, I, I know this IP address. Uh, I want to see what Lawrence Systems is response is. So you send the SNI for Lawrence Systems. It kicks back a certificate. The negotiation occurs. We encrypt it. But being able to capture the SNI traffic is how a lot of blocking systems work. And it, this goes both for corporate and the Great Firewall of China. So ESNI is an extension that allows that piece of information to be encrypted. That way you can encrypt the send of the network traffic, like the header of what website you actually want to go to. Now, by the way, this is very specifically only the header. Like if you look at the URL at the top where it says zdnet.com, that's the only thing SNI sends. It doesn't send the whole URL. It's not, it's not parsing it. It's made for specifically asking for a certificate when you're doing it. But being able to encrypt that, hey, cool. The downside is as some, as companies move to this and China right away is just blocking this blanket. Like if it's ESNI, if they can't see what website you're going to, you don't get to go. That's, and we're probably going to see, I, I think it's interesting because on the global side, it's China. On the more macro side, we're going to start seeing more companies block this. And it's going to be some interesting downgrade attacks, um, figuring out how the browsers, because it's been built into the, uh, I know Chrome's had it for a little while. I believe Firefox has as well. And this is going to be interesting because there's going to be like any TLS or any security when there's previous versions that you have in for compatibility, you then have the downgrade attack vectors of how does it handle, how does it traverse the leveling down from an encrypted SNI uh, down to standard one on there. And we're seeing growth of both TLS 1.3 and this. So it's going to be kind of an interesting how they do it, how we see it played out in the corporate field. Uh, the short term people are going to block it, but the long term is it was in the earliest days. I've been doing this long enough. The answer used to be block SSL sites so we can filter them. That was what companies wanted to do. <laughs> now, they would have sent everything over plain text so we can filter them. Well, then they came up with ways they could filter sites. And uh, now this goes a step further because even installing a certificate makes this it, it's still difficult. That was the whole purpose of uh, the TLS 1.3 implementation is to create a very, very secure connection between your browser, your 
your directly just the browser, not your system, but in the browser all the way to the website. So all pieces in between can't see it. That sounds great unless you're China or any government that wants to do any type of filtering. So I just thought it was kind of interesting that they that this as it's ramping up is also becoming a bigger challenge uh, and just being blocked. So wow. I love this kind of stuff. You gotta it, love it because you know this this will be you know you talk about those downgrade attacks. When you think about mobility and you think about you know the internet of things, industrial internet of things, you think about uh, you know just uh, uh, assisted living infrastructure grid, <laughs> right? When you, when you think about just about everything is starting to become an endpoint. These type of attacks affect more than just the citizens of one corner of a country. They start to affect every single thing that we interface with on a day to day. Our vehicles, the stoplights, the stop signs, because TLS ain't going nowhere. You know, and encryption is not going anywhere. It makes sense. So when you look at this, it you know, these are the types of things that need to be poked at, uh, for sure. Um and you know, I I think that the fact that it's it's being blocked already kind of shows it's uh it's potential for uh uh, being something that is going to be harder to actually break and, and get in between like that last comment you made around, you know, it's only a matter of time before governments, you know, get in between it. You notice yeah. how China's not taking that approach where it's like, you know, the five eyes or whatever, the the, five, the great five eyes or whoever you want to call them. They are taking that approach of, hey, let's just break every piece of code we can and we'll just read it all. We don't care. Where do you go? We just, just know we'll knock on your door at 5 a.m lucky if we don't fucking knock it off the, the hinge it, you know whereas like china's like no 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 we won't even let you fuck up because we don't want the bodies to stack we'll kill you all. yep right <laughs> like, <laughs> that's true um and kind of then now part of the other reason for bringing up the china is the automatic invasion system and uh mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is a project to work on, and this is very, this isn't just fuzzing. This is evolving censorship evasion with an AI system. So what they're doing is really diving into and building uh, data sets with AI that constantly not fuzz, it starts with the kind of the normal concept of fuzzing where we throw everything at it and we see what goes through. But it, it starts refining its technique each time to figure out what can or can't get through and are doing it at the TCP handshake levels. So um, like part of the thing they said, so four basic packet level actions, drop, duplicate, fragment, or tamper. And they're literally tampering with the TCP segments in order to figure out exactly if they can do something unusual. And I think if you scroll down here, Xavier, on your GitHub, by the way, this is all open source. That's also uh, tickles my fancy for sure. Um, as it builds the strategies, they're rewriting TCP packets to try to figure out what will trip up essentially these censorship systems. And uh, like the tamper TCP flag replaced with our parameters in this action describe how the packet should be tampered. So they're literally adding a corrupt checksum to a TCP packet that the filter goes, huh, throw it away, it's corrupt. But then figuring out how to reassemble that to also bring back the data that it, it's really intricate. It's very, the level of technical detail, like you need a fuzzer to do this because uh, trying to have a human iterate this would be really difficult. And this system is doing it dynamically. So as they right. patch these, it will, it, as they patch a, you know, the Great Firewall of China, it can reverse it at the same time. It can keep going, what's next? What's next? What's the next iteration that does get by the filter? That's Steve back there? Yeah. Steve. Oh, Steve needed a credit card for the company. <laughs> I need one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't remember where I left it. And, <laughs> yeah. See, Steve remembered where I put the credit card. <laughs> now, so does every, everyone else knows it's in one of there my lockers go. up there. There's a few. There's a few uh, layers that you got to go through before you. For one, you got to make it through Steve. Trust me, he's strong. <laughs> yeah, and if you were to break in my building and steal my credit card, that seems dumb. But yeah. that'd be a total waste. Total waste. We'd see it. Like, a physical credit card. <laughs> 
get notified for each scene that goes on there. So yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. I think we, we only got this? one more story left, and that's WordPress. WordPress. Oh, okay. Another WordPress. <laughs> so and yet another WordPress. Yet another yes. WordPress. So yeah. here's the thing: automatic updates WordPress. There's good and bad here, and it good has to do a lot with the Word, WordPress ecosystem. I like the fact that they're getting automatic updates. Now I used to do, you know, I started doing web development probably around 2005. Um, I got out of it about a year and a half ago. I just completely got away from web development. My company did, and we, you know, sold that part of the business to another company. You pretty much need to anymore. You can't just sell a website. They're not static. They have them in there. You know, it's not just the dynamic updates. Uh, that they need because you want to be an evolving or dot com business and you want to look pretty a website. It's all the security and patch management that comes in there. But the challenge is with WordPress when these plugins get abandoned. So you find some plugin that you know draws a map for your your customers to see or automatically loads a menu, whatever those extra WordPress plugins. And that was some college kids product. And they abandoned it. They graduated and they moved on. Then someone says, hey, I'll buy that project for me for a few dollars. This is where these problems I feel are going to pivot. So cool, you're updating the framework. And maybe I'm reaching here to say, but I think this is a challenge. The ecosystem of plugins could also create more problems too. Because these, these systems are going to go from sitting to pulling all the new code to be patched. But what if that new code contains more bad code because of that? And of course, the challenge that's going to hit web developers here is we already know this from the WordPress sites that we're still maintaining. Updating them breaks things. So <laughs> it is, it is yeah, a, a mess. Break, updates break shit. It'll be up to... Um... Man, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to go about this one. I think it's a good and a bad. I'm it's a good and bad. It's more good than bad, though. I'll be honest. I do. I will say it's more good than bad, um, because, like they said, there's uh, 455 million websites, and there are, there's been some really heavy uh, WordPress attacks out there when people find a flaw and it runs like wildfire because no one updates anything. So I, I do see the good side of it for sure. I just play a little devil's advocate because we've ran into this problem where plugin updates um, were the problem. Right. And right. that's then been- Then you get to get some free hours. Yeah. They need to clean up their ecosystem, I think. It's, it's nothing better than getting free hours because all of a sudden something's self-updating. You're like, oh, all right, here we go. I just Finally think they're going to have to broke. spend some time really digging into and cleaning up the ecosystem of plugins that they have because that's just going to create um, – Is that's where a lot of these problems are. Abandoned plugins are a huge problem. Maybe they should just flag them disabled and constantly make the uh, – go but through some type can. of verification that they put the plugin writers through. I think there needs to be like a component onto it more than just sending out the updates. The updates are important, especially the core updates. They've been doing that for a little while and getting better at it, like the, the WordPress framework itself. But the plugins are usually the pivot points of problems more so than the main, you know, WordPress being a commercial company. They're good at keeping their code secure. They're good at updating it. They're quick to patch. Um, but the plugins are just a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Plugins are where all the action happens. Yeah. It, they just open up huge threat surface areas across there. And a lot of times you choose a plugin. There's not, you just look at some stars. Oh, look, this has got like 30 reviews, 40 reviews. Right. This is the plugin. And it does the thing I want easier than the other one that has less reviews or does have more reviews. A lot of times, you know, the web developers are not necessarily security people. So they're looking the at it from done. a functional they're not standpoint. trying to like figure out the most secure option. They're just trying to get the job done. And yep. most of the time you're underpaying them. So don't go bitching at them. If you want security, you got to, that's an aftermarket add on, you know? Yeah. <laughs> You gotta yeah, we go use, buy the um, club. It don't come with the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We use a WordFence. Um, we've been using that for a while on all of our websites, and it's it's really solid at helping you mitigate some of the attacks and things like that. I run something by WPMU called Defender, I believe. I think it's called Defender. And there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah. The word the word fence one has an active uh, web application firewall, so it blocks attempts and bans IPs. So does the, uh, the WP. Which Someone um, got filled out one of our contact forms, was mad because we're blocking Tor. And I'm like, no, we're not. And 
I said, but yes, we are, but no, we're not. And the reason I said that is because our website, if it's attacked by a Tor node, it blocks by IP address. And they're like, you should turn it off. I'm like, no, no. It Once it sees so many attacks, it just shuts down. I'm sorry about that you're also trying to visit my website from Tor, but welcome to Tor nodes. It ends up blocking lots of VPNs too. When I look at the block list on my, on my WAF, it's long. <laughs> get, a, get another exit node. They're, just, they're giving them out. They're free. Yeah, just keep yeah. spinning them. Rotate those exit nodes. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, fun times. Ron, you have fun? I did have fun. It was a lot of fun. I like hearing this stuff. Yeah, it's always fun, the, it's always fun diving into these, talking about all these stories. There's never an ending of it. I mean, this is... We can't. We just try to scrape this. We didn't really talk about ransomware. Don't worry, it, it didn't stop. We just kind of didn't. I don't, skipped no. it today. <laughs> yeah, we kind of skipped it this week because um, last week we talked about Canon and uh, Garmin. So mm -hmm. the big oh, the yeah. big boys have been playing in a ransomware game. So <laughs> oh, yeah. in between, yeah, there's the probably a thousand companies in the last week that we could, if we spent any time looking, we could find. <laughs> Yeah, most of the big ones have been hit with ransomware now to some point or some degree. Yeah, so. it's I it's noticed really how Travelix didn't make it back into the news after a while, which is nice. That means no, they no. went back online and went smoothly. Yeah. So, so Ron, you you work you work in the industry. Uh why do you think that we never get good debriefs as journalists? Now speaking as a journalist, not as an insider, but you know, as a journalist? Yeah, like why do you think us as journalists don't get good debriefs on, let's say, Travelex or, you know, any other large, large type of breach? It seems like we always get like a gloss over. We get like the first, the first high level meetings worth of content, right? Because I think the main thing, the reason why you're not getting it is because you got to think about that company. Um, to, to actually give you a full down and dirty debrief of what happened. And, and I can think of a couple off the top of my head. You have to air your dirty laundry. And a lot of those times that dirty laundry that you're airing is some, some configuration or some gap in your security that you either knew about and chose not to fix or seems so blatantly obvious to the, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, blatantly obvious to the security of the industry that says, well, I'm done. Why didn't you fix that? And so then by airing that, you kind of make yourself look bad. Incompetent. Um, incompetent. And so companies, you know, if you're like SANS, let's say SANS, you know, to truly air the dirty laundry to say, well, this individual, you know, clicked on this just because, you know, they just weren't paying attention. You know, Donuts. Well, Free donut. you know, <laughs> you know, there's yeah, you, you're airing that mistake, and and if that's your if that's your bread and butter, if that's how you make your dollars, then you don't want to air that. Um, and then the other side of that is also, you know, by airing that dirty laundry, you're giving other you know, other people. Well, I wonder if they fixed it. If they didn't fix it, maybe we can compromise it before they fix it. So then, you know, you're you're giving that opportunistic attacker, you know, a a possibility that it's still open. You know. Mm -hmm. So and, I think there's several reasons. And it's probably the legal side of it. Uh, a, a case takes a long time. So oh, yeah. even though they've, you know, even if they do patch it, the time to, we we caught the threat actors, we're building a case against them. The trial's not two, is two years from now. And right. it, it, it's sometimes trial papers is where we do find it. Cause when they have to go through right. the details That's of it, when it's trial papers. Um, and, and you know what, and you, and you kind of hit nail on the head, right? Trial. We see we see more and more of these folks going to court these days, but we still see a lot of these ransomware actors not being caught, not being, you know, kind so of. So they have to hold all that until there is a trial, right? Like, like right. is there a is there kind of like do you know of any effort in that arena of you know like does it starting to seem like the ransomware guys are just getting away with it? At There's a, point. a cold Almost case like stack somewhere, parting in 1990s <laughs> or something. And then further on that, on the legal side of that is by releasing some of this information, there's a fine line in the, in the legal world where, you know, by, by releasing information, you're admitting guilt and, you know, if, if you're, and then you open yourself up to lawsuits outside of the regulatory requirements, an individual can then sue a company because my PII 
information was just released and I did not authorize it. So there I am for, I am justified in suing you as a company. And so you try to, you know, release enough information so that you're, you're not hiding something, you know, you, you, you have that perspective that you're not hiding something, but you want to release just enough information so that you're not opening yourself up to a world of problems going forward. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, me and Tom, me and Tom always go back and forth. How the fuck do we get information? Where's our data? We want to know. We want the debrief. We want to know how they got hacked. But I guess it makes sense. <laughs> and the other, the other side of it, as we've worked a little bit on side of these, um, I've got at least two I worked on that never even they're local companies, and none of it was ever in the news. They they they're happy that it wasn't ever debriefed at all. And to say it exposed the gap. They literally called away thirty thousand dollars out of a company. They don't really want to talk publicly about it because they barely fixed it. <laughs> yeah. oh but I think that that I think that opens up a, another issue, at least as I see in this community from our side of the fence, is because you know we're talking about well, we and that's what the most that's why these type of groups are so important is because you have that trusted community that you'll maybe provide a little bit more information than you would normally get or deem from. The, the general public, because you know, attackers are definitely talking. They're definitely right. communicating. And so we're sitting here going, man, why can't they just tell us what happened? Can we at least get the IOC so that we can see if the same type of activity is going right. on in our environment? Well, normally you wouldn't get that. The only way you get that is if you're in these type of trusted communities and this information sharing. Information sharing on the defender side is just as important, if not more important, than it is on the attacker side. I, that's something Sans did, and in their debrief, there's a warning if you scroll down on it, which uh, towards the bottom. Um, well, one of, not the bleeping computer link we have, but on the actual Sans site, it, it's mm. best if we don't pull it up on YouTube. They actually showed the indicators of compromise, and that's like you said, that's a really important aspect because we can now use that as a pattern to go, oh, here's these, and it's of course some really obscure looking. Uh, garbled list of domains, uh, weirdly formed, that do look suspicious right now. Of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. but when you're talking about trying to filter through a list of DNS lookups on a large network, if you don't have a way to filter or look for those, it can be really challenging. But by releasing that, how many other people have someone waiting on their network uh, for an attack like that? So yeah, I, I, it's trying to figure out the right way to do it. Uh, I, I actually do some, I follow some of the Alien Vault feeds. I think, Xavier, you do as well. Some of the- I use so Alien Vault OTX. Yeah, so you can kind of watch those. That's information sharing is important um, from that anonymized standpoint, like they do in Alien Vault. They don't tell you who's got the problem, but they're like, all right, we know this is a problem. Don't ask you where this came from. Uh, here's the here's the feed. You, and Alien Vault does a nice job with their sim stack and having just public feeds available uh, for you to pull from. And they're starting to tell that you can buy from intelligence companies. Yeah, so, right. That's a whole nother business. Whole anyway, nother business. We'll ramble on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is good. This this has been an amazing chat. You know, we always try and keep these within the hour. So yep, we gave you, we gave you guys an hour. Dog just decided to exit stage right. Exit stage right. <laughs> got a couple things we got to go do. Oh man, well this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, Ron. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for inviting me. It was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. You got anything you want to plug while you're here? No, I don't. You got a mixtape? You got a mixtape dropping? What you got? <laughs> <laughs> mixtape. <laughs> no, not plugging anything. Uh, All right. Mine's plug and mine's not. Fair Just enough. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, if you want to work with me and Ronald, ping my line. You know how to get in contact with me. If you don't, hit up Tom because Tom knows how to get in contact with me. Uh, yeah, I'm easy. Easy to find. Easy to get a hold of. We'd love to come break into your building and listen to the uh, the way the sound waves from your windows. There you go. <laughs> I don't. I won't do no eavesdropping. <laughs> I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> Video. Yeah. Record your uh, monitor from the, the next parking deck over. What, what was that? Uh, the the Tempest project that did that. There you go. Tempest. Right. Yeah. I don't think that works as well on these uh, flat screens, but we get the no, idea. No, not quite. Yep. Not quite. <laughs> All right. Well, till next right. time. Been a pleasure. We're out. Thanks, Thanks guys. Uh -huh. Bye. Later.